of Passangula River. I mentioned this started out in 97, uh, it went through 03, and then we worked in 08 and 09, and you can see number of sturgeon captured was pretty high, and then it went down just a hair, but the, we, we spent two years of an incredibly amount of effort, and we spent almost as much effort as they did in any one year trying to catch these, and this was post-Katrina. We didn't find many. And there was lots of uh, information from state agencies that big sturgeon were found dead in, in both the Pearl and the Pascagoula on the water. They had a lot of fish killed. The water is pushed upstream. I'll show you that in a minute from Katrina. And we can't actually say that Katrina killed off some sturgeon, but because they're skip spawners, they spawn every couple of years. It may have been a year that a lot of them were getting ready to spawn. We don't know that. Um, and, and such that, that that cohort might have been wiped out. But a better story will come a little later with the kind of work we're doing more recently. Um, and so we think there might have been an impact. We can't actually say that. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to take it to court to say that. But in fact, uh, there was most likely an impact uh, because all this water was moved upstream into fresh water and uh, had, had uh, released a lot of organic material from the, the wetlands and that all came back and there was huge areas of hypoxia. Uh, and again, these are bottom dwelling fish. They sit on the bottom where you tend to get low oxygen. So Katrina came in. Uh, we all know pretty much about that. It was a, a five meter storm surge. And you can see here, this was in 04. This is the passing Gula system here, which is where these animals migrate up. And you can see how inundated the water was in that system in a comparative sense. The water moved very far upstream. There was a lot of hypoxia, a lot of organic material coming out of these wetlands, which is not unusual, except that it happened within just a few day period. And so we think that there was an impact um, on those systems. So spring ahead, just a year or two, we, we, last July we got a, a fairly large grant from NOAA to go out and, and to do a lot more of this kind of work in the lower part and work with little fish if we could find little fish. And we were concerned because we didn't have a whole lot of luck like the first two years finding many, any fish. But uh, uh, it's, it's been amazing this, this last fall. Uh, we have a lot more money for people. We have a lot more time on the water. We have a lot more gear. Uh, so we're able to do a better job. Uh, and so, again, we classified them by size. We were focusing on these two groups, some smaller ones. You can see these little guys, slightly bigger guy. Uh, and we were trying to specifically look at their movement patterns relative to food availability and sediment grain size. So we've got another team of people working with us uh, here at the lab, Richard Hurd, his group, and, and uh, um, Kevin Yeager over at the Marine Science Program at Stennis. And they're doing benthic resource availability, sediment distribution, percent organics in the sediment, and so on in these areas. And I'll show you some drawings of that in a minute. We're, we're sort of hip deep in that right now. Um, I mentioned before that up near Hattiesburg in the leaf is where, you, in, in the buoy rather, is where you find uh, the spawning site. We're spending most of our time, the NOAA project, spending most of our time between these two. Here's Gaucher. Just to give you a schematic of where we are, this is where we're spending time. We're spending time down in here as well. Uh, doing a lot of sampling, a lot, and we've got a lot of buoys out this time. This is the one that, like, skips. So right in the middle of all of this, when we started this, the oil spill happened. And I can't say much about that, or I'd have to kill everyone in the room because it's all legal. So what I can say is, is we spent a lot of time, that sort of just happened, right in the middle of all this other sampling. So we had to scramble and get some other stuff going on. And, and what we were able to do, and this is sort of the team that was out there, we were able to put together our, our traditional NOAA sampling with some NERDA sampling, and we did some nighttime sampling because there was some suggestion that sturgeon move more at night, but no one's really got a lot of data. It's just sort of people in the, in the world of sturgeon say, yeah, they seem to move more at night. Uh, and so uh, the team went out, and it's color-coded based on what gear. And we can talk about this because we're not giving you real data. And so you can see based on colors, they did some night sampling, uh, and what we did find, in fact, is we got more at night, but actually less effort. Okay, and we don't know if that's because they're more active at night or because when they do move, they just don't see the net. And so they get entangled in the net in a, in a greater way. We're going to work on that this summer. Uh, um, we, we bought a small side scan sonar where we can actually visualize the fish in the water and see what's going on. But there seems to be a day-night thing, and so uh, um, we can look at just don't worry about the numbers. The key is is... Here was Jean-Marie's thesis, the two years where we found 80, uh, 08 and 09, we've got only eight animals. You can see the size distribution. This is what we've gotten so far this year. We've picked up a few more than this. So we've almost, we've got like 25 fish out there, tagged out there. If fish is small as this, so it's a really good story that 
someone is spawning out there that didn't get wiped out earlier, but again, we're also getting big fish as well, which is really encouraging. Uh, um, NERD is only interested in big fish. The NOAA project is interested in any size fish that we get. So we're, we've got a, an opportunity here to really get a handle on what's going on. And you can see, this is Paul, this is Jean-Marie, this is my student, uh, uh, um, Bradley, what's his name? <laughs> but you can see there's big ones and little ones, uh, and these are all from last year. This is sort of day-night sampling. You can see the numbers are much uh, larger at night per unit effort than a day, and you can see how small these guys are. Uh, it's a bit more tricky sampling at night in the dark, um, but it, it works. This is Todd Slack, uh, our colleague. And we, we captured a couple of other fish that we had tagged in the past. Some fish that were tagged in 01, we captured them in 2010. They're a nine-year-old fish. They grew about 6.2 centimeters. They, they grew a bit. We captured one of our fish from 08 that Jean-Marie had collected, and it grew 27 centimeters. So there's some differential growth going on. The fact that we're recapturing fish from a number of years ago is very encouraging for the restoration of the population, the recovery of the population. Um, and so here's where we are now. We're doing, like I said, we have a bunch more money. Uh, so this is, again, the lower pass. Well, this is the east. This is the west. Each of these circles is a buoy now, 750 meters. So we've got a lot more buoys out there. Each of these diamonds are benthic stations where we go out and take grabs of mud on the bottom pull them up, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. And from those, we can get density of organisms that live in that mud that these fish might feed on. We can also get percent organic car carbon of that uh, sediment and sediment grain size. And so we've got a whole lot of area. And you can see some of the, the tracking of our fish, again, tends to be in this area. It's a much more finer scale pattern because we've got more uh, uh, ability to, to search for this. Thing. That's an adult fish. This is a sub-adult fish, slightly smaller, but again, a lot more. They're spending a lot more time in this area than even the adults do. Because remember, the adults are coming downriver, and they move out to the Barrier Islands, and they spend most of their time from about October to about now out on the Barrier Islands feeding. Okay? And all the younger guys, some of these sub-adults sub go out there if they're big enough, but most of the younger guys stay sort of in very shallow areas. Um, and this is a late juvenile Again, it spends a lot more time sort of up in this area. Again, not very much time anywhere up here. And so uh, um, this is one of the bigger fish we got. It's Paul. And there's one of the smaller fish we got. And so what we're able to do is take that data and make some of these, these pretty colored maps that I showed you earlier. But it's actually real-time data that we got at the time we're monitoring the fish. Whereas the old data was data that was three years old by the time we were able to, to do this. And so... Uh, as I said, here's a map. There's one of our smallest guys. And you can see the tag that's on the outside right there. That's the acoustic tag that beeps every 90 seconds. It, it, it signals the buoy that it's coming by. And we know who it is. We know what size it is. We know time of day it is. We know where it is in, in geospatial uh, 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 patterns. And so we've got all these uh, um, sort of haphazardly placed or systematically placed uh, uh, benthic samples. And we're, we're just now getting into some of that stuff, trying to figure that out. The other thing that just came on board was a new project that started about a week ago, a month ago actually, but the money showed up a week ago, on Ship Island. People may have heard this Mississippi CIP program, post-Katrina program, that they're going to restore a lot of things in the area. One of those is Ship Island. Uh, this is Ship Island post-Katrina. It's about three miles distance across here. Uh, fairly shallow, a lot of ripples. But what we're trying to figure out, from, old, from the older data of Ross, we know that they spent a lot of time on the ends. And we know there's some records out here and some records down there, but they never spent any time in there searching manually. So we've got right now, there's 21 buoys out there. These are pretty much the locations. Trying to record what fish are out there. We're late in the cycle. We're going to be pulling them in May. And we're going to have a whole year next year to do this. Because summer, spring of 2012, the Corps of Engineers are going to come in there and they're going to fill that in. And they're going to build up the whole area. And what we want to know is, are the sturgeons spending time there? Are they potentially feeding there? And we're going to do some acoustic Doppler profiles, which is a fancy way to say we're going to look at current speed. We're going to look at currents that move through here and on the ends as well. And we're going to use our sonar to try to find where they are. Um, so there can be some mitigation uh, for the process, because the process has already been passed by Congress and the money's available to do it. And so we're just starting this project, so that's adding another dimension to our, to our work. Um, and this is stuff we've gotten permission from NERDA to show, because it's not their fish, it's NOAA fish. We've got to keep NOAA fish that NERDA's not paying for 
from there to data because we can't talk about that because that's legal. So here's our river, the Pascua system. Our laboratory is about right here. There's Deer Island. That's the Gulfport Channel. Here's Ship Island where we're starting to do some new work here. And note that the, the current ship channel comes out this way and then shoots that way for boats to come in. It's about 36 foot deep. Deep. They're going to they're going to widen it. They're going to deepen it to 45 feet deep uh, with the port expansion, and the port's going to come out somewhere out here. It's going to be huge. And so the question becomes: Is where are these little guys going? And this is a sub adult, 113 uh, centimeters. Here's the red dots where we picked it up on our buoys. We picked it up here. We picked it up the other side of Gulfport, and we picked them up there. So the sub adults, as we had predicted, are moving in other places, but no one had thought they would be up in the shallow waters. They all thought they would be sort of near the islands. Here's a late juvenile, 95 centimeters. Again, in our system over here, we've picked them up on both sides. We've also picked them up down here, but we haven't picked them up anywhere on the islands. So the little guys are spending time near shore, but not in the, not in the deltas per se. And so we now have evidence that they're moving very close inshore, and it's pretty compelling, and no one's ever seen that in these smaller uh, sort, sorts of animals. And so... Gulfport has to get a permit to build a port, and so they're going to have to deal with some surgeon work, we think, as well. And, and, and so that's pretty much all I, I want to say. It's been a really exciting uh, process, funded by a great number of different people. But the whole idea, for those of you that are at least my age, we all know what Tweety Bird is, but it's sort of the canary in the coal mine. The beauty and the beast of this thing is that these animals have to have this connection moving up river. So they have to have clean, barrier islands for the adults to feed because that's the only time they feed. They feed about six months or so, and then they move back up river. Those that are ready to spawn will go all the way to Hattiesburg and spawn. The young ones will, will come down as they develop, move downstream. The bigger ones will come back down. The non-spawners will go to these holding areas, and they just hang out all summer. We don't really know what they do. We're going to try to find out some this summer. We think it's lower temperature, low flow. They're saving energy because there's been no... The few that they've captured that are dead there that they found have nothing in their stomach. They've done some what's called stable isotope work. They found nothing in their stomach that's not marine, or in their, in their tissue that's not marine. So we don't think they feed much up in fresh water, but they hang out there for a long time. And if you're a meter and a half, one would think, I want to feed. But apparently they don't. So this connectivity is what's really vital. And so one, one of my Earth Day things is, if you see they want to put a dam on the river, it's really bad for this population, as well as stuff Paul worked on, Alosines, Shad, that do the same kind of migration pattern in the past uh, it's, it's really important to keep these natural systems as natural as we can, realize that there's going to be some development. Uh, um, but if we put a, a low water sill, like in the Pearl River, fish don't go north of that, which means that the packs they're spawning, because all the spawning sites are north of that. They can't get to it except on very high water which you don't find this time of year when they're going to do that. So I thank you for your time. I'm glad to see other people showed up. If there's any questions, I'll be glad.